Do you remember when photos and movies were a testimony to your cherished memories and not scattered bits across mobile devices and cloud services? Movie nights throttled by rising streaming costs. You've likely considered building your own cloud, a personal server that you can maintain yourself. But this goes way beyond just storing a few files. Your PC gaming backlog liberated from Steam's slow servers. That one obscure film you love but can't find on one of your eight paid streaming platforms? You can save the night with your own personal film library. A network-wide ad blocker, a security camera server, and smart home controls, all running on one machine. And no, it's not a fancy, expensive rack mount data center server. So what is a NAS? Let's visualize it really quick. Imagine your digital data, your family photos, your important documents, your favorite movies, as file cabinet folders. So now you have your digital file folders and you have your physical file folders. Now storing those files digitally on your computer is the same as storing those physical copies in a locked file cabinet. It's secure, sure, but only you can access them and only from that specific drawer. A NAS, on the other hand, is more like a library, a repository where these files are neatly arranged and accessible to anyone with the right access. Any privileged reader on your network can access this library of files on your network at any time, and even add new ones. NAS systems are robust and versatile. They can hold multiple hard drives and are equipped with operating systems that focus on maintaining stored files and controlling access. So if you've got multiple devices and users, each with different needs and access levels, a NAS system can handle that all smoothly. The simplicity of a NAS lies in its plug-and-play nature. Once it's all set up, it requires minimal intervention. And even better, its scalability ensures that it grows with your needs. Need more storage? Just add more drives. So the family and I were walking around one of those stores that resells returns from big box retailers like Walmart and Target. But towards the end of that journey in there, we stumbled across a little electronics section. That's where I saw this bad boy sitting there. So let's talk about what's under the hood. We have an i5-3470 3.2 gigahertz CPU. We have our 16 gigs of DDR3. Uh, it came with a one terabyte SSD, but I went down to a 250 gig Crucial. They're very versatile, so there's not really a huge need to have a lot of storage space on the boot drive. But once I got the unit home, this is all I had. I didn't even have a power cable that came with it. So it was time to figure out how to turn it into a NAS. I opened up the case for the first time. There wasn't really enough space to add any additional drives. It was kind of just meant to house a boot drive. So I was able to free a lot of space up in the middle by removing the hard drive bay that also was a disk drive bay. So I just went ahead and Velcroed the boot drive to the top of the unit and I'm just going to have this extra space in here for airflow. So then it was time to figure out where to put those additional hard drives. Since storage was going to be external, I weighed my options. I had the option of buying a multi hard drive enclosure or JBOD just a bunch of disks, but they're expensive and don't really have any redundancy whatsoever, which kind of defeats the purpose of a NAS. So then I thought about somehow mounting the drives outside of the case and connecting them with just longer cables. Option B sounded good, so I started researching on how I was gonna pull it off. I went to eBay and found these acrylic things that this seller was making that holds hard drives as well as a couple of 80 millimeter fans. So the next dragon to slay was the cables and how I was gonna connect them all. So I got the cheapest PCIe SATA card I could find on Amazon and made sure that it worked with TrueNAS. So then I got this six port SATA squid cable that comes nicely numbered and organized and plugged those into the SATA card. The numbering keeps them organized so you know what drive is what in case you need to get into the BIOS or do anything like that. So for power, this power supply only comes with two SATA power connectors because it's not expecting you to turn this thing into a NAS. So I had to get creative and I got a SATA power extension cable so I could at least extend it out to the outside exterior of the case from the back uh, hole. And then I have the normal SATA power breakout cable that you're used to seeing inside your PC. And I can get up to four hard drives going in here, which is exactly what I'm aiming for. And for bonus points, I upgraded the fan to an 80 millimeter Noctua fan from the factory Dell fan. I just figured it might give it a little bit more boost. I was just trying to get as much airflow as I possibly could, as much cooling as I could get. Oh, and also the 80 millimeter fans that are on the hard drive enclosure actually connect to an adapter that I don't have connected right now. I got my image downloaded. I opened up my favorite flash drive imaging software, Rufus, and made my flash drive bootable with the imaging software. The operating system install for TrueNAS is really simple. You'll obviously need a monitor keyboard and mouse for the initial setup. It'll just be a black and white page with some text on it. It'll ask you for a few things when you get started, just a few clicks and a few entries, and you're ready to go. It really is that easy. So now that you've got your headless server racked up, or in my case, put up on a shelf, you can access it from any other machine on your network just by opening up a web browser and typing the IP address of your server. In my case, my IP address is 192.168.1.132. 
I just type that in and from any machine on my network, I bring up my TrueNAS GUI and I can go ahead and type my username and password in. Now we're at the last phase of our journey, it would seem, right? Just install some software and we'll be on our merry way to enjoy our TrueNAS server in all of its glory. Well, it's not quite that easy. Yes, TrueNAS does come with several plugins that you can do point and click installs with, but not being able to set up your next cloud server with just a couple of clicks may not be a big deal to some people that are a little bit more tech savvy. And one of the systems you'll have to learn to install apps manually are called jails. No, we're not gonna come arrest you for that copy of Soul Plane you pirated, but we can pull some similarities from the real jail that we know in our universe and the jails that exist in the TrueNAS universe. So a jail by our definition is a place where individuals are held apart from the general population for safety or legal reasons, right? That definition gives TrueNAS jails a bad connotation. So I tried to come up with a little bit better of an analogy. So imagine you're back in high school science lab, right? Now, for safety reasons in high school science lab, you perform potentially dangerous experiments inside a secured, isolated area, right? It's to prevent accidents from happening to the rest of the lab. A TrueNAS jail is somewhat like a secured area in the digital world. A jail in TrueNAS is a secure environment where you can install and run additional software applications without them interacting with the rest of your system. Each jail has its own IP address and appears on the network as a separate device. It did take me a little while to get jails down packed. I did have a little bit of previous knowledge though. I knew a little bit about Docker and a little bit about Ansible, but I would understand and feel your pain if you are a complete novice and are trying to learn the concept of jails, but just take a step back, take a deep breath and attack it just like you would any other subject that you're trying to learn. Jails get really simple and there's a lot of really good tutorials online. But as always, don't be afraid to ask questions. The TrueNAS community is pretty huge and if if you know me, I value community support very highly, so if your open source project has a lot of active community members, I am all for it. After I got Nextcloud installed, I was on my way to having it set up exactly how I wanted it. Everything just started clicking. But let's see if you've been paying attention. I kind of hinted at it a little bit earlier. Take a guess on what component would have failed at this point. Time's up, it was the boot drive. <laughs> Yep, the boot drive failed. So at this point, I'm like, okay, no sweat. It won't take me that long to set everything back up. So I was greeted with that initial login page, just like you were before when you installed it for the first time. And I just tried it. I was like, let me just try and enter my old username and password. And it worked. I was like, okay, well, maybe everything's not completely wiped. Maybe the drives actually kept some of the information on there. So I logged in just as I would have before. I went over to my pools section. That's P-O-O-L-S, pools. Pools in the TrueNAS world is sort of like a virtual hard drive is I guess the best way to explain it. A pool encapsulates as many drives as it wants to. I figured the data would still be there on the drives, but I didn't think the pool would be there. I figured that was bound to the boot drive. So learning from that mistake, you can even improve that system and make it even easier if your boot drive fails to just pop in a new one, throw in a config file, and then just be ready to go right off the bat. But I gotta give my props to TrueNAS though. The experience has been really nice. I'm gonna give you a price breakdown of everything that I bought minus the drives. You can source those yourself. I'll even put a link in the description of a site that you can go where you can track hard drive prices. So let's start with that little hard drive rack and then work our way back. So that hard drive rack I found on eBay for $26.86. So the hard drive rack has two 80 millimeter fans. Those cost $6.99 each. The DC power supply for the fans was $14.99. And the SATA power extension cable that takes that cable and extends it to the inside of the chassis was $7.95. That numbered six port SATA squid cable that I showed you earlier was $9.99. All six of those SATA connectors that are on that squid cable all connect to that SATA card that I had installed in the PCIe slot, that top slot in there. That card runs now at $49.98. I did get it on sale on Prime Day. You might can find a better deal on one now, an alternative one. As you saw before, I did upgrade the case fan, which was not necessary, but I did upgrade it to that Noctua fan, which ran me $15.95. I also had to buy a five to four pin fan converter cable to make the Noctua fan work. That cost me $9.99. And the Dell Optiplex 7010 came with all of its components already installed, and that ran me 45 bucks. So almost the total project minus the drives came out to 202.68. 200 bucks, that's about the ceiling that I wanted to be at for a DIY project like this, because there are off the shelf solutions that can get you somewhat comparable of an experience, but I don't think they're gonna have as much power as the Dell that I got. I could be wrong. There could be some $200 solutions that are out there that may outperform this Dell, but I don't think many are touching that i5. I, that's just me though. I'll have to do some research, but I'd say that's overall a decent price. Let me know what you think in the comments. Could I have gone cheaper? 
Now let's give this project a difficulty score. I'm gonna give it a three to four. I'm not gonna give it a static score because I feel like this project can be very easy for some people, but you can also make it a little bit more of an advanced project if you wanna accomplish the things you wanna accomplish. If you want to only install the plugins that are available on the TrueNAS system and not install anything manually and just be okay with the ones that don't work, I would say this project is a three. If you wanna build it out exactly the way you want it and wanna go forth with doing some of the manual installs, you are gonna to have to get comfortable in a command line because you're gonna to have to set these jails up uh, exactly how they're supposed to be configured because if they're misconfigured uh, things can crumble really quickly but if you're more like me and want to customize this thing down to the faceplate then uh, I would say this is going to be more of a four difficulty score. You're going to be in command line. You're going to be scratching your head a little bit. If you want to get started on your home server journey, but want to dip more of a toe in and not jump all the way in with a $200 machine, then I would suggest checking out this video. It gives the basics about single board computers. A single board computer is basically just what it sounds like. It's a little mini computer that you can do a lot of things with. With that said, I'm going to go play around with my server. May the force be with you.